Okay, and our final speaker for this morning is Klaus Zicitek from the Paul Ehrlich Institute in Germany, who's going to um, give us a talk about the development and regulation of immunotherapy. Thanks very much. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to discuss development and regulation of immunotherapy, but what's really inside this talk is uh, converting um, in vivo T cells to CAR T cells and in vivo cell targeting. But I combine that with a little bit of regulatory considerations because the Paul Ehrlich Institute, as some of you may know, is in Germany the Federal Institute for Vaccines and Biomedicines, a little bit like CBO FDA, and at least uh, two persons of the list of authors that you see on this paper, Martina Schüssler, Lenz, and Egbert Flori, are sitting in the Committee for Advanced Therapies at the European Medicines Agency. Um, there are no conflicts of interest. As you see here, no funding has been received in any kind from industry. Now, what I want to cover is first uh, to review what we have seen uh, when we studied uh, the uh, clinical trials going on in CAR T cells and their licensing state. Then I'm going to cover a little bit the in vivo generation of CAR T cells, tell you about some regulatory considerations and conclude from there. What we've seen when we reviewed uh, all the CAR T cells that have been going on worldwide uh, until the end of 2016 is that about two-thirds cover leukemia, one-third covers uh, uh, solid tumors, but uh, only a few of these trials have really come to Europe. And as you see, the hotspots of development are either US or China uh, in that respect, and we wondered why trials were not going on more in Europe. That has improved a little bit. We have now 22 approved clinical trials in Europe that are ongoing. And as you see here, a number of trials are really um, exponentially increasing with all new targets going on. Uh, when you analyze the very targets uh, under evaluation, you see, of course, uh, apart from the CD19, CD20, and CD22 targets in B-cell malignancies that people have talked about, there's a variety of different targets that have been tried out with ongoing and non-active trials. And even uh, in uh, solid tumors, there is a larger variety of the different targets that are um, targeted using CAR T cells. That shows us, I think, that at this point of development, we're still in the trial and error stage and try to find out what are the best target antigens and how can we go about and um, target these cells. Now, what we have derived is uh, seen here, first of all, most of the efficacy that we're all referring to comes from the five trials where uh, about 85% of the treated patients in LL and non-Hodgkin lymphoma reached complete responses for four weeks to 30 months. The results are not really comparable yet because, as you see, the endpoints uh, are variable and also the time until uh, the endpoints were screened and monitored has been variable. There are high remission rates, and they compare favorably even with standard chemotherapy and antibody therapy, which is really a surprise, and there have been cases where even uh, some patients have previously undergone blood stem cell transplantation, and uh, nonetheless, the CAR T cells worked in them. So it seems that in some cases, at least, that can be an addition to graft versus leukemia effects of the blood stem cell transplantation. The CD19 target efficacy um, is uh, very promising and uh, impressive, but uh, it actually um, does not correlate completely with the B-cell aplesia, which has to be, I think, reviewed because you would argue that the target and non-target cells that you get uh, both contribute to the efficacy effect. Now, in terms of risks, as we all know, there are good uh, measures to try to at least um, control the risk, which is toxilizumab for the uh, cytokine release syndrome, uh, measures that have been taken with a tumor lysis syndrome, is prior chemotherapy to reduce tumor burden, or um, give subsequent consecutive doses within a day or two or three um, to not um, directly inject one dose or infuse it. There's quite a bit of on-target off-tumor recognition going on. Uh, of course, with the B-cell aplasias, that's expected, but there are a number of unexpected cases as well, which I think have to be looked at, and that's going to be difficult to see whether this is off-target effects due to recognition of new antigen expressed on normal cells or whether that's uh, inefficiency of the 
a specific target moiety that has been used in the CAR T cells. Now, in terms of neurotoxicity, um, single cases have been reported where we see in cerebrospinal fluid actually CAR T cells, and the discussion is going on uh, whether the two, uh, the neurotoxicity is due to cytokine diffusion, whether there is cell translocation across blood brain barrier, whether there are other effects that bring this about. And at least in one case with the Juno, uh, which you may remember, it is clear that uh, the neurotoxicity that has been observed is not due to conditioning regimen. Uh, here it was fludarabine instead of cyclophosphamide. And of course, there are also uh, some cases of acute anaphylaxis, which argues that uh, fully humanized single chain FE should really be used. Now, I just review here again the licensing stages. As you may have realized, uh, only in May, May has the um, biological license for the FDA approved Cymria been uh, extended to uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and uh, review is going on at the European stage. And you see also here that there are some prime designations. This is a Euro European form of um, providing more scientific advice uh, through the regulators in order to get a good application in as soon as possible. Now, as we all know, it is rather tedious, as the previous speaker has also argued, to uh, make these T cells. And there's a complexity of the manufacture, which argues that only certain centers can actually manufacture these cells. And there are a number of business models that have been going on. I didn't press anybody. Could you bring, bring up the slides again? Anyway, while the slides are going on, what I uh, wanted to tell you about our, our in vivo data, how we convert uh, T cells um, with targeting lentiviral vectors to um, CAR T cells. The way how we do this, let me proceed with telling you in general how we do this. Uh, what we have done first, uh, slides are back, that's good to know. Yeah, so we have quite a history of converting um, urine leukemia virus vectors and also um, HIV and SIV derived vectors into targeting vectors. And that's actually done uh, through very simple means. Number one, we have detected that you need to have separate uh, glycoproteins that uh, mediate the attachment to cells. And you need, in addition, a fusion moiety from the vectors. Let's hope it works this time. And as you see here, we started with uh, showing that you could actually pseudotype MLV vectors with HIV-1 envelopes and that's due to truncation of the C-terminus of the fusion protein in the envelope of HIV-1. We have then proceeded to also make uh, envelope libraries where uh, the attachment function of the uh, surface glycoprotein has been substituted by a single chain FV. Uh, we have proceeded to um, generate SIV, AGM, HIV-2 and PVJ vectors, which uh, were shown through the VPX to actually uh, also allow transduction of resting cells. We have also used then lentiviral vector libraries to select good uh, targeting moieties and proceeded to show that in vivo cell targeting is possible. And the latest is that we have proceeded to also use this kind of targeting approach to AAV vectors, which would allow to produce vectors with higher titers and in higher amounts than the lentiviral vectors show you here how we usually do that. You see um, in the middle of the screen up there the F protein, that's uh, the fusion protein. The first step is to truncate the C-terminus, as I said. The second step is to um, add a surface uh, displayed single chain FE or DARPIN if you want so. And the third step is then to mutate the natural receptor binding sites that have been done. And we end up with having either lenti or MLV vectors uh, with the trimeric envelope glycoproteins um, carrying the single chain of Vs on the right side, the AV vectors where it's capsid protein extensions that carry the single chain of V. Now, i show you here some data which show that selective car gene delivery in vitro into human 
and CD8 or CD4 positive cells can be done using the measles virus envelope. Um, the experiment was done in a way that uh, PBMCs were isolated, activated, transduced, and then a effects analysis was done, so this is in vitro data. As you see on the right side of the screen, upper right, um, first of all, when you use VSV pseudotype lentiviral vectors, you end up with 66% uh, of CD4 positive cells being transduced, whereas you end up with 30% of CD8 positives, which shows a certain preference for the cells, and it's not clear how that comes about. Uh, using the CD8 uh, selective uh, lentiviral vectors, we usually um, obtain something like 25 to 50% of CD8 positive cells in a mixture, and only 0.7% of the cells are non-target cell transductions um, that are at the level of sensitivity of the assay. The other way around with the CD4 lentivectors, as you see, we achieve 80% transduction and 0.4%. You can, of course, correct these uh, differences in transduction efficiency by simply adjusting for the um, multiplicity of infection. For the CD8s, you see on the left lower panel that we used an MR of 10 to 20 to achieve between 80 and 90 percent of target cell transductions. We only use one or 20 MRIs to achieve um, the same level of transduction and gene transfer in the C4 positive cells, and you see the results for the VSV. So that shows that we have efficient targeting vectors, that they differ when it comes to the target, but that CD8 and CD4 positive cells can actually be transduced. This is an in vivo experiment where not skid mice were actually uh, first infused with 5 times 10 to the 7 PBMC, then vectors were given in two doses at day 4 and 5, and then we looked at uh, the in vivo uh, transduction and gene transfer rates. As you see on the upper right, um, in blood and in spleen, we achieved something like 4% of transduction of the target CD4 positive cells, whereas we cannot detect any transduction uh, to the level of uh, the sensitivity of the assay in the CD4 negative cells. And as you see, the typical vectors do not go into spleen, but rather reside in other organs. Now, um, we have proceeded to improve the system, as you seen before the CD8 positive and selective uh, gene transfer vectors based on measles virus are um, not as effective as you would like them to be and therefore we have modified Nipper virus envelopes now which show the same separation of the attachment and the fusion activities in the vectors. We have taken the same approach of truncating them and as you see here we achieve uh, now gene transfer in vivo of 0.23% compared to a background level of 0.01 and a fair distribution in different organs, not only to a spleen or liver. Um, we proceeded then to show that we can in vivo generate CD19 specific CD8 positive CAR T cells, which efficiently eliminate their target, which are the CD19 positive B cells in the RAGI model as displayed here. Uh, first of all, using the Nipah virus lentivirus envelope, we achieve 40% transduction rates. Um, you see here that if we look at the CD40, uh, CD19 CAR modified cells uh, as percentage of the CD8 cells, we end up with about 30% being transduced. And uh, you see here that they are actually efficiently doing their job, which means that the CD19 uh, positive target cells are plated in vivo. That shows that efficiently specific selective cells can be targeted using this kind of lentiviral vectors. It also shows that you efficiently generate in vivo CAR T cells and that they actually do their job. They uh, remove the target CD19 cells in mice. Um, we have actually then looked uh, to see uh, to look at the um, proliferation and um, the expansion of the uh, initially um, targeted CDL cells that car, uh, carry the modified CAR T. You see on the left uh, upper panel that uh, the initial transduction rates in these experiments in vivo 
were at a level of about 0.3, 0.5%, but that in vivo expansion then showed that you end up with 40 to 50% of the specific CAR T cells. And you see on the lower level that if you deplete the B cells from this kind of in vivo system, that the expansion no longer takes place. This is an expected result. Of course, you depend on the target cells to expand in vivo, and it shows that from a rather low level of transduction, you end up with a high level of expanded uh, CAR T cells that do their job of removing the tumor. Now, with this, let's say, difference in um, efficiency of targeting specific CD4 and CD8 cells um, becomes that uh, you look for better targeting moieties than the usually taken single chain of ease. And here um, I show you the DARPINs that have been often used by uh, other groups as well. They are small in size, they have a good high stability. Very often they have a better um, affinity to the target protein um, and they target it with high specificity. And then there is another issue that a number of single chain of ease need cysteine aggregation and covalent linkage between those. You don't have that in the DARPINs. And of course, they have low immunogenicity. So the system that was built up in the lab is shown here. On the left upper panel, we start with the DARPIN library uh, and we uh, make in vitro transcripts. Um, the mRNA is bound to ribosomes and uh, the specific uh, DARPINs are then selected on ELISA plates, coated with CD8 receptor. Um, then after, again, a reverse transcription and ligation, we end up with DARPINs that are selected for specifically binding, at least in ELISA plates, um, to the target moiety of choice here, CD8, uh, the CD8 molecule. We then take these and ligate them into expression plasmids, and we can again select on specific cells, but we end up also with small-scale preparations of the lentiviral vectors carrying these different DARPINs, and through this we can select DARPINs that not only bind in vitro to ELISA plate, displayed CD8s, but also um, in vivo to um, cell displayed CD8s. See here that the number of different um, CD8 positive um, targeting um, moieties have been selected. They bind to different extents, and if you look at the data from some of these uh, DARPIN vectors that we produced using this, um, you see that with a lentivirus derived from a simian immunodeficiency virus, using a CD8-specific single chain of E, we've achieved uh, something like 0.3% um, on target uh, efficiency. And with a DARPIN, we have uh, actually now much better efficiency of 14.7%. Uh, this is the group that has done it, led by Christian Buchholz. I want to acknowledge that the DARPINs uh, also in part from Andreas Plückton from the University of Zurich. Now, with that in hand, let's have some regulatory consideration in general for the CAR T cells. I showed you earlier on that the issue is that Europe has been lagging behind compared to China and US in the clinical trials run. I think that's uh, in part due to the lack of infrastructure that we have. We need more disseminated knowledge about the rapid developments. The regulatory requirements are rather harsh in Europe compared to US. And there has to be assured that the product uh, is always identical to the chain and the cytokine um, release, tumor lysis syndrome, neurotoxicity, anaphylactic reactions, and other adverse reactions, of course, plays something that has to be managed and controlled. There is a suggestion that we could do this by um, producing better GMP facilities that would uh, specialize on CAR T cell production, uh, that we uh, actually bring in some facilitation on the GMO, that is genetically modified organism legislation in Europe, that we disseminate the knowledge uh, gained by different groups through a database, that we assure product chain identity by developing a general identifier, and that we develop better animal models to describe the toxicities. So in general, the Committee of Advanced Therapies um, 
and also the Paul Allen Institute think that impact of different CAR T cell type generations on treatment outcome is not completely understood yet. And in order to control that, we need very good prediction um, and controlled production to always end up with the same kind of pro product. Stem and progenitor cell contamination has, of course, to be uh, reduced in order to reduce the risk of insertion oncogenesis. And the risk management plan is of uh, very much important, and the follow-up studies to um, really understand later safety issues are necessary. And we have single cases of non-controllable CRS and TLS that we have to deal with, and the long-term follow-up will be part of the risk management plans. In summary, I think um, we have come a long way, and uh, with the last type of all the monoclonal antibodies being very efficient in cancer, we're looking forward to getting oncolytic viruses on the scene, some of which have been approved. The checkpoint inhibitors are marvelous currently in a variety of cancers, and we're looking forward to the next generation of the CAR T cells. And I think that brings a picture about that we tackle cancers through a variety of different mechanisms uh, that include oncolytic viruses, that include checkpoint inhibitors, but also include targeting not only the tumor cells themselves, but also the microenvironment. And what we've seen with the checkpoint inhibitors can come true also with the CAR T cells and combinations that uh, patients have really good chance of surviving their cancer, and that's where we we're going to go. I want to end up by just telling you um, those of you who are from companies or academics uh, trying to initiate clinical trials in Europe, the Paul Ehrlich Institute is a good address to come to. We provide scientific advice. Write to us using this uh, email address and uh, writing just by cab from the Frankfurt Airport to Paul Ehrlich is very short, so that's easy to do. Thank you. Have you looked at the um, complement sensitivity of your lentiviral particles with the alternative pseudotypes, and do you think you would get a better efficiency if you made your particles complement resistant? There's a little bit of complement sensitivity. No, we haven't looked in these experiments through that, but earlier on the sensitivity isn't really great, and I think we're aiming at uh, going to systems where we produce uh, vectors to higher titers and to higher dose. That's the way to go. I ask you, um, with, particularly, for example, with the modified measles virus, is there any concern about pre-existing immunity to measles virus with using this in humans? Yes, of course, there's always concern like that. We're actually doing experiments right now to show that uh, not always uh, is that a real problem because, for example, uh, using oncolytic measles viruses have been shown that with a rather high dose you can um, bridge this kind of problem and you can uh, still achieve good transfer and good reproduction of the virus. But there are people that are looking at uh, modifying the epitopes in order to get rid of the recognition by neutralizing antibodies and we're doing in vivo experiments to show to which effect second or third doses could uh, be a problem in people with pre-existing measles immunity. Great. Well, if there are no more questions, I wanted to thank all the speakers. I think what I've learned is you can all throw away your prodigies and buy yourself a nice coffee machine instead, since we'll be doing in vivo gene transfer. Um, and um, yeah, thanks again. Thanks to my co-chair too.